Hi, hello, here is Blanca Vergara from Parenting the Gods, Healing Humanity Through Parenting. Today we have another uh, guest speaker who is an inspiration to me. Uh, this lady, of course, is also a mother and not just a mother, she is, of course, a conscious uh, mother. She has uh, two children, twins, and uh, quite challenging teenagers. So she has handicap uh, for many of us in the subject of parenting. And on top of that, she, she's a single mom. So she has two children, two teenagers, and she is mom and dad. So she has a lot of experience to share with us. And uh, the subject that we're going to be touching uh, today is nonviolent communication. Hallie, Sally has uh, got uh, introduced into the subject of nonviolent communication through their own growth, uh, uh, through their own spiritual growth, through their own spiritual path. And that's mainly the conversation that we're going to be having today with Sally. Uh, Sally, I'm really excited to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm excited to be here as well and to be able to share and connect oh, about lots of things, spiritual, nonviolent communication. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Conscious parenting. That's a part of the uh, subject. Oh my God, you have uh, uh, twins. Yes. And, uh, uh, and, and this subject of nonviolent communication and conscious parenting. Could we go to uh, uh, an early experience or the genesis of how did this start? Because you tell me that you have grown into it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there was a a uh, pivotal point when you said uh, this is this is such an aha moment that I have to change my ways spiritually or as a parent or as a communicator. I always started my own spiritual development um, and I've been growing spiritually for about three years when I met um, uh, 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 someone who introduced me to nonviolent communication and we had lunch together and I remember them I remember she, she put these sort of papers on the table in front of me and I picked one up and I, and I read it and I was like, wow, it just made absolute sense to me. And that moment was, was it really felt like nonviolent communication was an essential door that I'd been missing up until that point. And it made such sense to me that if I was going to be wanting to connect with myself, then the next step was to connect meaningfully outside. It's and a mirror. It, 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 was, it was just such, made such sense to me, and especially to find a way to communicate which was peaceful and loving and connecting. Because I felt that those were really important you know, foundations on which to connect. And so nonviolent communication is for me now really important you know it's part of my life it's a very strong part of my work and you know at home yes <laughs> part of being conscious and part of connecting and communicating it all fits together can you give us an example of a, a, a challenging situation you had with your children and uh, how you uh, apply these uh, uh, abstract theory into your concrete uh, uh, parenting situation Oh, I could give lots of examples. I'll give one which happened about three weeks ago, and it was about a bag of crisps. <laughs> How good crisps can you get? The starting moment is so small. So we'd eaten our, our evening meal, um, you know, the kitchen, you know, I've said, you know, no more food, I'm not doing any more cooking, the no, kitchen's closed. And my daughter said, can I have a bag of crisps? And my immediate response was no. You know, I don't like the children have a whole bag of crisps. I think it's too much salt. Um, we'd eaten, you know, all of these things, all of these kind of reasons came out of my mouth. And I didn't think about her and what she wanted. So I said no. And at some point she went and got a bag of crisps, even though I said no. And my daughter and I had this most stupid argument about a bag of crisps. Really, really stupid. And in the end, I mean, it was in that moment, it was not a non-violent communication connection until then we sat down together 
and you know she was eating the crisps and I was able to connect with what she needed and actually it wasn't that she wanted a bag of crisps she was desperate for more choice because at school she would had a lot a lot of testing going on she didn't have much choice about what she was doing at school and she felt controlled and rushed all the time and what she wanted in that moment was not actually a bag of crisps but she wanted to exercise autonomy and choice wow. so, it's so yeah, profound it, exactly and it was so sort of the, the, the trigger was was so small but it shows me how much all of the time the children are giving me impulses to let me know what they really need and if we can take the time to sort of slow the whole thing down and for me really to listen and ask or not even not always even ask questions but reflect back you know gosh you these back of chris seem really important to you jessica yes you know well you know um i can't imagine you're hungry and no so you know is it you just fancy so we had this whole conversation and eventually you know we come to all this stuff going on at school and, the, and what's fabulous for her is in the process she's able to connect with herself and she's able to put the words to what she's feeling so the learning is is huge it's huge and quite likely if i was jessica putting myself in uh, jessica's place i will have just left the bag of crisps <laughs> No, it was, it was, it was, that was, she was determined and she's, she's a determined little girl. And, and I think she also knew that we could have some points of connection and, and communication, but I'm really glad we had that conversation rather than me being, feeling resentful because I'd given in. Because yeah. the other scenario was I could have kind of like, oh, I don't care, you know, eat the crisps and then being cross about it because yeah. you haven't listened. Yeah, you're pa passive aggressive. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm really, really, I'm really glad. And those sorts of things, those scenarios, every time it's the children telling me they need, they need something. Yes. Yes. All the time. All they have to do is figure out what it is they need. Yeah. Because sometimes they themselves do not know it. And in this case, she didn't know, but she no. needed. No, 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 no. And that's the great thing to be able to guide them through. You know, I mean, sometimes they come to me and they say, I need more rest. Sometimes they'll come and they'd say, I need, I need, you know, I, I need not to do my homework. I, I feel tired. You know, and, and that's when I think, hurrah. But that's you know. profound self-awareness to say, I'm tired. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, and that, but then I know that there's something filtering in, you know, or like when I say I'm tired and they'll say, why don't you go upstairs and have a sleep for an hour? <laughs> You know, that ability to, to empathize and connect with what my needs might be. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's what, it doesn't, I, 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 it doesn't work all the time. And, and sometimes I am in a rush and I am tired and I don't have the energy. And it's just like, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, get on with it, you know. But it makes us have more opportunities for connection because I'm aware of, what's going on and can slow the whole thing down. You, you can, or you could. I can, I can. And I give the space to slow it down. So even if it means that dinner's late, even if it means that um, we're late going somewhere, you know, often it's about time, isn't it? Often you don't slow down because you feel rushed with time. Yeah, it's a, it's a perception that we don't have time. Yeah, yes, yes. And it's all the perception that that other thing is more important than this. Yeah. You know, and actually this is more important than anything else to be. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and that's that, that me having now a, a greater sense of awareness of, oh, this is a moment, you know, let's slow down time and be present here to what's going on. And you know what I found uh, remarkable in uh, my experience doing this with my children? Uh, the, the, well, you know, they are little, one and three years old, uh, but the souls are complete. Uh, uh, let's say he. Uh, he smashes the car or he goes and pucks on the thing. And uh, now we have a, a 
and uh, an ill, um, uh, uh, one of our family members is in the hospital. And uh, so we, we tend to be in the hospital quite often these days. But he just doesn't understand the hospital thing. He just sees the absence of his parents. And he smashes this and smashes that, and he does this, misbehaves. And, uh, and I got him in my arms, and he burst into tears. And then, now I want to burst into tears myself. Then he was a mirror for me, that he was missing his father. And then I realized that I was missing my husband. Ah. So I wanted I want to have with you this this conversation and um, the child doesn't know what he's saying or doesn't know what he's feeling but he's feeling and he's actually mirroring you he's teaching you something maybe you want to speak about that yeah I mean well not only our children everyone is mirroring us all the time that's true yes, <laughs> our children but I noticed I noticed that when I am feeling under pressure stressed, tired, all those negative types of things, the atmosphere in our house gets prickly. It gets, it gets spiky. And the children get more short-tempered, they get less cooperative. And I find that one of the greatest things I can do for the ease in our household is try to smooth my energy. So when I notice myself getting smart spiky, I'll say to the children, um, one of the big things we use is a visual. I use a visual thing for my patients. So if my patient is as big as a watermelon, then all is well. But if it's as small as a pea, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's a way to help the children visualize where I'm at. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I want to use it because it's better than uh, zero to ten. Watermelon yeah, pea. That's great. You know, it was brilliant. I, I, when Jessica was small, I remember we were going, we were going upstairs, you know, it's bedtime. And she said to me, is your patience big enough to read a story? Wow. And it was like, well, you know, and I loved the fact that that had gone into her body and, and, and she could visualize it. And it helps them understand their own patience. So yesterday, Jessica was making a bracelet and it, she, it was really hard for her. And, it, you know, and she said, oh, I don't have the patience. And it was giving her, you know, she used the words and, and that connecting with her own body. Because I, I think nonviolent communication, when you're, a lot of it, it, it's about understanding what your needs are. What do I need from, you know, what's going on for me? And those signals can come from your body. And if we're disconnected from our body, mm -hmm, as many, oh, we know, are. many of us are, then you can't get the signals to what you need. I really would like to go deeper on that disconnected of my body. You know, the... Uh, when I was little, I, uh, I used to go to long, uh, long trips with my father, and uh, he used to go and back and praising me for uh, not asking to go to the toilet. So I was just the best little girl in the world because I never asked to go to the toilet. So I learned not to ask to go to the toilet. And now as an adult, I, I have problems, you know? And now I have to say, you have to go to the toilet. <laughs> I have to force myself to go. <laughs> it's, 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 oh, there are so many ways of, 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 of learning that disconnection. School doesn't help because school has these rigid moments for drinking, toilet, playing. School doesn't help. Um, when, I, I, when my children were small, I encouraged them in every way they could with just the physicality. I mean, even now. I'm not very fussy. I don't mind if they eat with their fingers, because it's helping that connection between the food and their body. I don't mind if they eat with their, you know, I'm not fussy about that, because I think it's helping the connection. It's helping them stay, stay with themselves, you know. And I teach my children little meditation, little, little ways to meditate. How do you um, do that? How do you do? Well, at night time when they can't sleep, um, I taught them two different things now. So they lay on their backs and they put their hand on their tummy and with and then they press they breathe out and as they breathe out of course their little hand will go up and as they breathe in their little hand will go down and then so all i teach them to do is just to focus on the up down up down as they're breathing 
And it's just a way to focus so that they're not busy with their brains. Because often with my children, when they can't sleep, it's because their brains are full. Okay. And this is just a way of transferring their, their focus to one place. And the physicality helps them focus on something else. And it's a one point focus. And it just helps them drift into sleep this more easily than being beautiful. busy up here. And then so, so I taught them that first. And now I'm teaching them to focus on their nose when they're breathing to focus just on the little tip of their nose. So it makes the area even smaller. Um, that, that sounds really so powerful. A, it's very powerful. And it's a very, very good technique because once they can start to focus here with their breathing, they can use it during the day. So because, they, because you know something, one of the biggest complaints that I hear uh, everywhere from uh, these modern children is that they cannot sleep. And they cannot fall asleep or they wake up easily. And I, I think this is a goal for many moms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, just, it's, it's, I think there's a lot also around getting your children into a routine. So my children always knew that after dinner it was time for bed. There was never any television. There was never any playing. It was dinner, finish, upstairs, bed. And, and, okay, it's different now because they're older, but for a long time, until they were seven and a half, dinner and bed. And, it, and I think it's that, that routine is important. The children need to know where they are. Their bodies need to have that, that recognition. Yeah. And the same thing they say to us as adults, you know, don't watch violent films before you go to bed. You know, don't read the newspaper. Children need the same thing. Um, I think don't, don't, don't watch violence. Well, don't. <laughs> No, there's very, very less. I mean, yeah, children. Are, um, even my, I still monitor before bedtime what my children watch. You know. But it's so hard. Huh? The, uh, uh, yeah. I got like five, seven films uh, to watch for my children, and they were uh, little children allowed. Oh my God! This was uh, this had a, a, a war scene. The other one had a, a how call it um. Uh, a bomb, you know, uh, um, well, I, I don't know, I, it's, it's incredible. I belong to a non-violent communication parent uh, forum online. And one of the questions that came up recently was from a mother wanting, she was fed up reading violent books to her, her children. And they were like one year old and three. And she said, the violence doesn't have to be as aggressive as bombs and guns. It could even be somebody taking away someone else's power. It could be someone undermining someone else. And when, when you take the, the threads of violence that are in our society, many of which we don't even see, it, it, it's astonishing. Yes. Oh. You know, and... and, and That's and, and painful, that, yeah. You're right. And so, I mean, it, we think of violence as being this aggressive war soldier thing, but actually taking away someone else's violence, someone else's power, is a huge act of violence. Manipulating someone else to do what you want them to do is violent. Um, a non-violent communication is about bringing awareness to that. I think so, even lack of presence is violence. Yeah. Abandonment. Yes. yes. Well, it's, it's strategies that, that exactly because of lack of lack of connection to self, and that's the strategies that people develop to try to get some sense of power back. But, you know, sadly, the strategies are violent ones. Yeah. Oh, God. That, that, and now this uh, brings me to the, the, uh, one is the abandonment, like uh, the not being present because I have to work, because I have to be away. And the other one is uh, uh, I, I'm here with you. I'm watching you on the telly with you, or, or uh, you're playing with the child, and you are with the uh, tablet. Or, uh, <laughs> Lack of presence, that's just so painful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and, and oh, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And it's that's teaching the children as well to do that, to replicate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, oh, yes, I wish, yeah, I hate those things. I hate How do you manage that with teenagers? With, with electrical equipment, yeah. I mean, I give my children an hour a day um, for their electrical equipment. So that count, that's, you know, iPad, um, computer. Um, as they get older, they need the computer more and more for homework. So it then becomes much more of a sort of slippy line 
about where homework ends and you know where something else begins. But I still only try to give them an hour a day, um, which I think is enough. And if they contribute to the household by doing jobs on a weekend, they can earn extra time. Um, but you know it's a difficult one because at some you also have to teach them to take responsibility for what they're doing on there. You know, like we will have to do as adults. We can't sit the whole day and play Minecraft. You know, as adults, we have to monitor it ourselves. So there's also that balance, that question about at what point do you start to give them the responsibility to manage it themselves and manage it themselves. Yeah, that, that that's a, a, another very interesting subject in communication with children. Um, uh, I, I think uh, we also we both have teenagers. I have a teenager. <laughs> He started yeah. with the subject of uh, I want to dress what I want to wear, oh. and uh, and I think uh, uh, your children must have the same. Huh? This is the age in which we would like to wear this uh, dress this way, and uh, it's very funny. But I encourage it. <laughs> I I go and tell him what do you want, what do you choose, do you want this one, do you want this one, and. Uh, uh, I think it's a way of creating their leadership skills and their decision making, uh, etc. Uh, how, how do you see that? How do you solve Absolutely. it? I, I remember reading um, a book about parenting. I can't remember what it was called. Oh, it was when, when, when my children were small, and it was it was said something like, "Every time I make a decision for my child that my child could make, I'm telling my child that they're incompetent." Well, every time I make a decision for my child, I am taking, telling my child he's incompetent. And it really stuck with me, that line, because I think it's right. How, and, and it was, I, 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 the examples, the child comes to you and says, Mom, I'm hungry. And you say, no, you're not. You've just had dinner. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mom, I'm feeling tired. You can't be. You've just woken up. Every time. You're, you're denying the child their reality. And, and, and it could be that a child has just had dinner but is still hungry. I can be. What, you know, and why, because they're children, do you deny them their reality? Or we go back to the story of the crisps or the beginning, <laughs> that they are not really hungry, but they have another need that we yes. need to uncover. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's... Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's the point. One of the foundations about nonviolent communication, it's taking the time to connect. Every, what was it? I, I wrote down a quote um, from Kelly Bryson, and he's written a fabulous book called, um, what was it called? Um, Don't be nice, be real. Don't be nice, be real. And he says, all communication is either an SOS or a care package, a please or a thank you, a need or an offering to meet a need. And I love that, that simplicity. But it is true. That's what it we is. do. All of us. All of us. All of us. All of us. And it, 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 it's true. Adult, child, it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter. We're all saying, I can help you with your need, or please help, help. me. And, and what we've missed is, what we've not, what we've forgotten is how to hear that. How to hear that? Uh, how, how do we do that? How to hear the need to to try to sit without judgment, to try to put away your story, your whatever is going on with you, like with Jessica and her fists, to, to put away my, oh, I'm incompetent, oh, I didn't cook enough, oh, I'm a bad mother, to put all of that away. Yeah, oh, you know, all of my judgments about salt, you know, to put my story away so I can sit with her with an, uh, a full heart and a mind empty of judgment. And then you can ask the questions. So uh, I will uh, paraphrase you in uh, of what you heard. But I heard presence, mm. no judgment. Yeah. Let go of my stories. 
Yes. Oh, I get it. The goosebumps. Yeah, this is. Uh, this is. The, the the world will be uh, in peace if we were doing all all yeah. this. It's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I um, Marshall Rosenberg. He is the founding father of nonviolent communication. And um, when you read his books, he has many, many of his personal anecdotes of going to mediate in places which are classically in conflict with each other, North Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, um, uh, 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 the East and the West, Iran and Iraq. You know, classic conflicts constantly. The 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the people in Israel and 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 the other land the is israel and palestine yeah israel palestine. and palestine you know and and, and and deep deep cultural conflicts and when once you can see the human needs because we all want ease we all want connection we you know and, and those human needs are the same for all of us yeah no matter what our background or educational color or or, or, or politics and once you can see the humanness of those needs yeah. it's so easy to meet them yeah yeah and that's the beauty of it but that's so powerful because uh, if we as parents start doing this then our children will start doing this in exactly. their everyday relationships and then with their children yes 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 Yes, in, in Utrecht, here in Holland, they have um, a, a, a project which they call Vrede in the Wijk, Peace in the Village or Peace in the Community. And there are schools which are working with, started working with nonviolent communication, and they found that it wasn't enough just to have it in school. And then they started to spread it out to families and then the community at large. And that, that's the way to go, you know, to have this snowball effect. Yeah, and uh, I uh, I hope this inspires people to uh, to do it in their community, whatever they are uh, watching. Uh, I would like to to ask you something for the uh, for the beginners, you know. Uh, uh, let's say people like uh, uh, like me. Now we have a, a, a dear family member in the hospital. Uh, and we have our jobs and we have our businesses, uh, so we're stressed and worried. And we have little children, we have a little baby, a one-year-old, a seven-year-old. Um, so stress, worries, uh, uh, 21st century life, you know, iPads and stuff, and newbie moms. So I'm uh, putting down the picture of my family. That's the picture of every family in the world. Give us your top, uh, let's say, three tips on uh, nonviolent communication. What can we do? You know, the first thing is to care for yourself, self-empathy, self-empathy for the situation you're in, to give yourself the love and care that it's okay to be where you're at. Because if you can't take care, if you can't give yourself that empathy first, you won't be able to listen to someone else with compassion. So first and top tip, take self-care first, self-empathy, and to allow yourself to be angry if you feel that you're overstressed, to, 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 and to, to, to even verbalize it, to allow yourself those things, absolutely, because you, you need to take care of yourself and you need to love yourself. Oh, you do your best. I, I love that. You need, yeah. You need to cry, if you need to yeah. be angry, yeah. if you need yeah. to... And, it, it does, and it's okay for it to be too much. It's okay for you to find, for a one, a mother, to find it hard work. It's all all right, and, and, and to allow yourself that. Because yeah. very often as mothers, we just feel we have to keep doing everything perfectly all the time. You know? Yeah, and we have to keep all the balls in the air. Yeah, we have to it's it. okay to say that it's hard. So self-care, self-love first, most, most importantly. And then try not to jump in when you see something starting to happen. Try not to jump in with a fix, with a solution, with a strategy to solve whatever you see is going on. Try to sort of step back, because oftentimes children can solve things themselves. 
And just giving space can solve your stress problems as well. Um, and if you can hold back and you know keep out of their story, it gives you also a chance to see what's going on with yourself. So slow down the time, slow down the process, don't jump in. And the last thing is withhold judgment. Try not to assume you know best. See what's real, see what's aligned for your children. And then you can connect. And uh, uh, maybe the, the, uh, the openness to, um, uh, I have something to learn from here. Oh, God, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. With, yeah. Withholding judgment, judgment uh, be curious. It's, uh, maybe there's... Withholding the judgment that because you're the parent, you know best. Because you're the parent, you always have to have the answer. Because you're the parents, you have to tell them what to do. Um, I think what, one of the things that I've learned with non-line communication is that it shifts the power, the, 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 the power, shifts power, shifts the ratio of who's in control to make things more equitable. You know, my children have a lot to say about what goes on. But this um, is, uh, I love that you use the word power. Yeah. Because uh, uh, in many relationships, it's the molar who has the power. <laughs> and it just that, that makes you so weak, actually. Because yeah. if, if you have the power, then uh, who else is going to ever help you? No, and, and, and we, I believe passionately that I have to educate my children to hold on to their power, not to give their power away to hold on to it, to know what it is, to, to know when to give it and when to keep it, um, and to keep in their power, you know, and, and this stuff. Oh, unfortunately, I think the education systems, family, structure, society, there's a lot of abuse of that power, you know, and I think it's, it's hard for children to learn to stay in their power, because of, particularly at school, you know, that, that rank, that, you know, teachers are abusing rank, teachers are abusing power. Yeah, uh, and it's hard for children to, to, to stay in themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but power is a really important word. But uh, uh, and now these days, I've been thinking a lot about the subject of power mm -hmm. and the fact that we have uh, misused that word yeah. or uh, misused the concept in a way that power is to. Uh, uh, suppress somebody when I see that power is to elevate ourselves and elevate others. And I think this subject of nonviolent communication could be doing that for all of us. <laughs> it, it helps you keep in your power. It helps you keep close to what you want. Um, I, I, I was due for a coaching session with my nonviolent communication trainer last week. And I got an email from him saying, Sally, uh, I've got a migraine. Um, I really don't feel well. Well, I don't feel I can be present for you this evening for our session. And I'd really like, to, you know, can you help me out by, by, you know, can we discuss changing the date? And when I heard his need, I'm in pain. I can't be present for you. It was so easy for me to, oh, boy, yeah, of course. But he didn't have to tell me the story. He didn't have to make something up. He stayed in his power. Yeah. And, and then, uh, by being uh, vulnerable, he was powerful, actually. Vulnerable? I mean, uh, this is about, about exposing your vulnerabilities, because you're talking about your feelings. I feel. I need. Mean. When I see, like, if I see my children fighting, you know, um, I will say, oh, I see you two fighting about the, um, a game. When I see that, I feel anxious because I value harmony in our house. Um, do you think you could find a solution? And that vulnerability, I'm saying what's important to me. Wow. I'm saying that I feel anxious. Wow. But it's allowing them to respond to that. I want to put light on what you're saying because uh, uh, context, you're talking to teenagers. And you're telling them, guys, this is what I feel. Can you find a solution? And it works. Yeah, I mean, not always. I can't say that this is 100% always going to work thing. But I 
what I observe is that as my children get more used to me being in this space and me using this sort of language, it gets easier for them to hear it. Because, you know, it, it must have been at the beginning. Well, no, they've had it now since they were four or five. But I can imagine if somebody just starts moving into this sort of language, it can be very strange yeah. for teenagers. And they're asked to take responsibility for themselves. They're asked to, to, um, to, to, to stand up for themselves. And, you know, because it's a lot about power, stepping into your own power. Yeah. So for, I can imagine for some teenagers, it would be a huge shock. But I guess uh, 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 it is absolutely impossible to make a, a black and white change. Um, as uh, um, you have shared with me, uh, you, um, your spiritual uh, journey has been an evolution of step, 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 yeah, step. Yeah. And with that, the non-violent communication with your yes. children as well. So I don't think anybody uh, of us, we, we cannot go from... And it's a constant process. Yeah. I mean, I mean Marshall Rosenberg, Marshall says that, you know, the, you can't constantly be in non-violent communication. And the point of it is that non-violent communication allows you to stop being such a fool because you're more awake. Yeah. And, and that's it. You know, I am not constantly in that room. I can't be. In the same way that I can't be constantly in the God group or the love group or whatever you want to call it. You know, sometimes I fall out because I'm stressed and tired and busy. But it gives me a place to be able to go back to, which is a safe place and more useful than where I was before. And it has its, its advantage to, to be uh, out of it. Uh, like, can maybe elaborate on that because I, I, I perceive something. It, it has to be. You, you can't, I mean, I am understanding that I can't constantly be in the groove. I can't. Um, I mean, the more I practice, the more I'm able to stay in for longer. So what used to be a question of just sort of dipping in for a matter of seconds and falling out, now I stay in for weeks at a time. Um, and that's just from practice and awareness and mindfulness and, and, and focus. Yeah. Um, but even with the non-violent communication, our languages can be such a trigger. Yeah. And if I'm not really having my head on what's happening, whew, then I was, I was I'm, I'm, I'm in the old way of dealing with things um, before I know it. Uh, so it takes practice. I mean, I still get coaching. I still am um, on my parenting group. Uh, you know, it's it's like it's a constant life skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I love when we have contrast. Uh, when uh, you know the um, is comparing a, a, a something on comp well, uh, comparing something completely different. Uh, uh, my husband and I are trying to eat better, and we're trying to uh, get rid of gluten. Oh. And uh, uh, we were very good for several days, several days. And suddenly I really wanted a croissant. <laughs> and I had it. And I had two of them. <laughs> I had a stomach ache. Mm. And it was horrible. Mm. And I think uh, um, when we are, have the practice, a spiritual practice that brings us love and peace, we're so happy that we forget how happy we are. And when we let go of uh, these practices, it feels horrible. Oh, yes. I think I love that because, I, that, yes, because I actually feel pain, physical pain, when I'm out of the groove now. And I, and I hate it. And, I, and it's uncomfortable because I know the difference. Yes. And I, 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 I cannot sleep and I have a stomach ache and I have headaches when I get out of my uh, spiritual practice. So part of what, what I also hear us talking about is non-violent non communication, but also in a bigger picture of spiritual practice. Because um, one of the things that I love that Marshall says is that if you use non-violent communication as a strategy just to get what you want, it's as violent as shouting and screaming. <laughs> yeah, it's Machia uh, Machiavellian, yeah. Yeah. So, so, it sounds, yeah, oh, you, like you can do it. But I think 
there's a difference between doing it and living it from the heart. And that, yeah, that I think I find that really important to say because I do think that there's a connection between nonviolent communication and spiritual practice. Yeah. A very important connection. Elaborate on that. <laughs> mm. Yeah, tell mm. us more. I think that's a very profound, uh, important subject. Between spiritual practice and nonviolent communication. Yeah. Well, it's the connection from the heart. Um, now, what I wrote down, what did I write down? about from the heart. Did I have a quote for us? Because I love some of the things that um, that Marshall says. Um, I haven't written anything about the heart. Um, oh yes, yeah, Marshall said, non-learning communication is a way of communicating that leads us to give from the heart. And that, and the heart is for me, the root of spiritual practice. And if we can get that connection to our heart, then you're living the nonviolent communication, not just doing it. Yeah. You're being it, you it. You're being it, absolutely, absolutely. In the same way that when your spiritual practice, when my spiritual practice is in the groove, I'm radiating and vibrating that higher energy. Yeah. And then I don't have to think about nonviolent communication because I'm living it and doing it and and and, and it, it exists. It just me. flows. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, let, if we backtrack to our mums with children and 21st lives and small babies, it's very hard sometimes to even think about when am I going to go shopping, let alone when am I going to have time to be mm. spiritual. Um, <laughs> And I, and I think it's, 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 <laughs> well, what I find really hilarious is that uh, uh, we are spiritual all the time. <laughs> yeah, but what I observe with people is they think that it's something outside themselves, and it, and it, they think it's something they've got to reach to rather than come back into. And one of when, when I talk to when I'm trying to coach people, you know, one of the things is well, how am I going to find time for all this? You know, how am I going to fit this into my schedule? You know, I don't even have time to go to the gym. Um, and it's getting over that block of time, energy. Um, and I think it's important somehow to make this accessible. Otherwise, it's a lot of hot air talk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it has to be a way Practical. for people to find a way to connect to it. Yeah. Um, because I, yeah, if, if I remember my early days, my, my, my steps were stumbling, my spiritual steps were stumbling and I was trying to find my way and, um, I wasn't always aware of what I was doing, but I did feel a drive to want to move forward and want to change. But in the early days, I had no words for it, not the words I could do now. Um, so it would be, it'd be wonderful to find a way that this becomes more concrete. How are you making it concrete yourself? For myself, definitely with the with with, with my mindfulness. When I, I and this this my focus on um, constantly being aware of what my thoughts are, where my thoughts are. So my meditation teacher has this wonderful image that I love using. And he says, imagine that you're sitting on a riverbank and the riverbank is when you're in your heart. And in front of you, the river is flowing. And he said, whilst you can stay on the riverbank and observe the river, the river is your thoughts. Imagine, you know, you can just observe your thoughts going by. Oh, there's a thought about the plumber. Oh, there's a thought about my dress from last summer. Just watch your thoughts drift by. He said, what you don't want to do is to dive in the river and be swimming around with all your thoughts, because that's when your mind gets in the muddle. So that's what I have in my head, this image that every time I know I've dived into the river and I'm swimming around, I pull myself out and I'm back that's on the sick. river bank. I'm back in myself. And I do that constantly. Um, and what I do now is in my head, I have three baskets for my thoughts. 
One is from the past, one is from the present, and one is from the future. So as the thoughts are drifting by, I'm, I'm going, oh, that's come from the past. Oh, that's come from the future. And, and it's got nothing to do with this moment, because the only place I need to be is here and now. So helpful. And so I manage, I'm constantly managing my mind. And it sounds like, oh God, I'm really tired. How am I going to find the energy to manage my mind? I can't manage my shopping or whatever. But well, it gets to be in you. Yeah. It's it's just it's just it's not hard work. Well, I find it fascinating the baskets because um, yeah. once I have uh, something written somewhere, then I can forget about it. So I had a thought. Oh, I have it in the basket. Yeah, fine. Yeah. I I can let go of it. Yes. And, like uh, uh, you were saying, oh, my, my dress of last summer uh, is, is in the basket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can forget yeah. about it. And it's brilliant because it, it, it's, it's not letting all that stuff clutter up your brain. And then, and then if your brain's not cluttered, you can be in this moment. And that's when, when things are going off with your children or colleagues or your, your partner, you can be present to that moment. And then the nonviolent violent communication can come in. Um, so keeping your mind still. Keeping your mind present. The own, I remember, I think it's Osho who says it. The only place that you can learn is in this present moment. So it's the only one that's real. And if we get stuck in the past or right. the future, right. it isn't, it's not real. It's not real. Um, and that's the, one of the biggest things I learned was how much of my behavior was being driven by past or present thoughts that had no relative relationship to what was going on now yeah once i could free myself from that the world opens you know i mean and then 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 life gets exciting yeah because you can you can actually do something oh it's all, I mean, all now sorts things, all sorts of things i can grow i get more time because i then can step into that 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 fluid flexible time where time becomes three-dimensional yeah because I'm not fixed on the past or the present, then, I, then I'm in that this wonderful three-dimensional space, timelessness. Yeah. I get more time. Yeah. I don't get pressured for not having enough time. There is there is more than enough time. Yeah. I get to to manifest things. I get to make my wishes and see them come true. The right wishes in the right way. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's exciting. It's exciting. And it it's is cool. exciting. It comes back to yourself. It comes back to I mean, I, um, my 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 nonviolent communication uh, trainer talks about radical self responsibility, and I love that radical self responsibility. How much you can take responsibility for yourself, and how far that can go, further than any of us realise. Beautiful. <laughs> Because that, that, that way you consciously change your life. Absolutely. Radically. 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 And that's it. That's exciting. That's really exhilarating because then uh, you have these just two, two baskets. And if you want more baskets, you can invent them. Past, yeah. present, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know, whatever you want. Uh, countries or subjects. And then you can be in the now. Yes. Yeah. Be careful you don't use this as a strategy to keep your mind busy. Because if you have too many baskets, then you go, ooh, which basket? No, no, no. <laughs> so, past, present, future keeps it very simple. Yeah, that keeps it you're simple. just giving yourself another strategy to keep busy. Yeah. And the idea of this is to yeah. unbusy and to slow down. Yeah. So, you know, be very careful that you don't just replace one busyness with another sort. Because yeah. uh, it would be easy to do. It's very easy to get into the business, huh? Yeah, it's very easy because we're so used to it. And I, that's how our minds are used to working. So what we're asking our minds to do is to work in a radically different way. And of course we're going to resist. I mean, your brain just resisted by coming up with the other basket. Yeah. Of course we're going to resist and, and, and keep it simple. And if you get it too complicated, you won't do it. Because exactly. you're like, which one, where, and oh, if where So we're uh, reaching the uh, the uh, the end of the time together, and uh, I will ask you uh, to uh, to ask your uh, own intuition if there is something else important that uh, that for now we need to tell our people today. 
I would say the most, thing, the most important thing is actually to believe in yourself. And it's such an old the sort of phrase that gets thrown around, isn't it? Oh, just believe in yourself, you know. But I think that the, in, the inherent strength of the message has gotten lost. Oh, because it's been used too much and used too easily. And I would say, you know, as mothers out there, believe in what you're doing and believe in the power of what you're doing and the importance of it. Um, and, yeah, uh, it, that I think is so, so, so central. Believe in yourself. Believe in the job of mothering. And believe in the importance of it. Yes. Oh, Sally, thank you very, very much for... Uh for sharing all this uh, goal for us, for uh, for the, the for the mothers, for their children, for the children of their children, it's, uh, it's really powerful. Uh, dear friends, uh, if you like this content, please subscribe to our channel. To subscribe to uh, our newsletter, in Parenting the Gods. You get more information that I don't share here online, and uh, uh, and I also would like to ask you to uh, leave some comment there below. Particularly, uh, I would like to know if you had more ideas, more tips on how you implement nonviolent communication in your life uh, so that more people learn about this and more people get inspired and get practical ways on how to implement nonviolent communication. So uh, for now, I would like to uh, say goodbye. And remember, live powerfully. Hello and welcome. This is Blanca Vergara from Parenting the Gods. Today we have a brand new guest with us. Her name is Sally Edwards. And Sally Edwards is uh, as well a mom. She's a mom of twins and they are teenagers. So she has <laughs> loads to tell us about them. Uh, and uh, uh, she's a single mom. So she has uh, another different experience of, uh, uh, of motherhood. And at the same time, she's a business owner. She lives here in the Netherlands and teaches English uh, uh, at schools. And uh, in this journey of motherhood and uh, of uh, also with her students, she uh, slowly uh, started discovering that uh, conscious parenting was the path for her. And in this path, she also discovered the concept of nonviolent communication. And this is the reason why she's here with us, because uh, with her interest in nonviolent communication, she has become some kind of an expert in this area. So she's going to, uh, uh, she's going to help us uh, understand what is that, what's the relevance in uh, conscious parenting, what's the relevance for you and me, and, uh, uh, and how you can uh, get more information and uh, how can, you can expand and apply that in your uh, family. So I'm delighted to have you, Sally. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. It's a delight to be with you. Thank you. Oh, great. Sally, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to start from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, from the beginning, um, uh, I would like to start the genesis of uh, uh, how you became a mom and how you uh, because I, I love how you introduce yourself that uh, uh, you started gradually getting into conscious parenting. So I don't know where is the beginning, when you learned that you were pregnant or when they were born? Maybe um, take us back. I, I can link the concept of conscious parenting with my own sense of self-consciousness. So as I get more and more aware of myself, um, what my brain is doing or not doing sometimes, you know, it, it becomes more and more clear to me that I need to apply the same principle that I apply to my brain, actually not only to my parenting, but to the world that I live in. Um, you know, so, so, so the, the step with my own slow development is matching, you know, the, 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 my conscious parenting. So I, I, I I don't believe that this consciousness is something that's instant. I think it's slowly, slowly, slowly removing layers. I agree with you. It's not a, uh, it's not a switch. No, no. Uh, 
if, yeah. if, uh, if at any moment there was a, a, a pivotal point or a, because there are many moments, well, but uh, uh, one that you remember that could be the genesis of this for you. It's been so slow. Um, I think certainly that moment when I realized my life was never going to be the same again. And, and, it, and, it, and it was, they were very, very small. And it, and it was beyond the practicality of, oh, I'm never going to sleep again, or I'm never going to have a hot meal again. It was this sense of having these two small people and being very pivotal, pivotal and important in encouraging them to be themselves and that that wasn't necessarily going to happen by itself. And I had absolute clarity that I, I knew the education system wasn't the place that that should happen, that, that encouraging children to be themselves should happen at home huh. and wouldn't happen at school. And I guess maybe they were six or seven because, um, because that's when in Holland the education system starts to get more structured and more strict. And that's when my children started to rebel against it more. Um, and and, that, and that then I started to fit together more of the development that I was doing in my heart, you know, to, the, to being a mother. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you bet. This, uh, uh, the, my son will start a school in November. And I'm starting uh, uh, the, to have the angst of uh, uh, how is that going to transform him and how he's go is, this is going to transform me. I bet that's, uh, yeah, that's yeah. really serious. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, um, they, yeah, I mean, my children are both um, highly gifted with very mm -hmm. high IQs and they're in a Dutch school and which doesn't cope with them, you know. So it, 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 it's, I mean, it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to be putting them in a, in a, in a system that's not um, coping with them. Uh, and the, the Dutch government is, is not allowing home education anymore, or, or very, very, very rarely. So the amount of choices for, for children in education gets less and less and less. Um, but that's another story. <laughs> well, it, uh, it, it somehow links because um, what you are doing is to uh, compensate for that at home. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And so how do you absolutely. do that? I, well, I'm really lucky that my children have two, uh, two half days free. Wednesday and Friday afternoon, they're free from school. Um, and we make space in those days for um, doing other sorts of things. So that's when we are still doing our arts and crafts activities. We're still going to museums. You know, they do their sports activities, but you know, I, I try to limit that so that I'm still having a role educating them. So their education is not handed over entirely to school. Um, and I, I'm quite structured about that. So you're, you're right with the word compensation. You know, so if I have to put them into that strict structure, you know, in the week, then I, I'm compensating and balancing it, you know, with, with what's happening at home. Yeah. And I have to say, there are days when they're not sick, but they still stay home. You know, and, I, and I'm not embarrassed about that. Yeah. You know, because I, the, the, it's, it, it exhausts my children going into that structure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what I love is that you talk about creativity. They, yeah. uh, what they do is uh, uh, to create. Yes, it's really important. Um, and and um, my daughter's learning Chinese calligraphy. You know, my son's building things. Um, and and it's very very important that 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 they can stay connected to, to that part of themselves. And the more they go through school, the less and less of that that they do. So it's a very important that at home, you know, to find a way to balance it. Is this uh, um uh. Is this your way to uh, to maintain their consciousness? Is this uh, the way to maintain your consciousness? Oh, well, I'm certainly very creative with, with you know myself, and I'm painting and drawing. But it's a way of it's a way of maintaining connection, and and that's the most important thing for me to have a platform where we three can have connection, and have a place where we're being together. Um, because, you know, school can take them away, sports can take them away, but sitting around 
from the table together with our things, whether or not, you know, I'm painting, Jessica's doing her calligraphy, Benjamin's building something, it's our point of connection. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, because, because that, for example, I chose in our family, the dining table, we don't use it to eat at, because, you know, at the end of the day after school, they did not want to sit around at the table and be still and be quiet. You know, it was really hard for me to have a classic sort of family dinner. So I chose not to do that. Um, and we, we sit in the conservatory and we sort of have a picnic uh, <laughs> and, and, and we, we sit on the floor and, and we eat in a whole other way um, because, it, you know, the classic way of eating wasn't, didn't work and it just meant I did a lot of nagging and they were really cross and they didn't eat. So it was a huge part of, of, of me thinking, well, what's going on and what works for us? So I abandoned a lot of the things that people say you should do. Awesome. Awesome. I think I'm so excited because uh, lately we've been talking a lot uh, here in our community on what we should do and oh. how to practically uh, choose what we want to do. And I, I love this example of eating. Why should we eat it this way, the way we uh, were taught? We can oh. eat in a different way. I, I remember having quite a lot of anxiety about it because mm. I read some American... Project, a, a report, you know, that said that families who didn't eat together, the kids had more social problems, blah, 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 blah. And I said, like, oh, no, you know, what am I going to do if you don't eat around the table? But then I thought, well, what the report didn't say was, did the families who didn't eat together, what was their alternative? You know, and our alternative is the time we spend around the table making things and playing games. Or the times we go out and we walk on the beach and we walk in the forest. You know, so the, the dining table doesn't have to be the only point of connection, you know, or meal times yeah. doesn't have to be the only point of connection. And in our family, you know, that's not a time that when we are together, we have other times. Yeah, yeah. And why not be able to choose that? Yeah, why not? I, I love that. Why not? Why? I mean, and, and that, I mean, if you, I mean, one of your questions was, what's the definition of parents from the gods? You know, and it's that, you know, wh why? What, uh, ah, don't get stuck in that box of you've got to do something because it happened to me or because my grandparents or my parents did it. <gasps> yeah, yeah, this, uh, that, this uh, uh, definition of how things should be and uh, we just keep repeating the, the patterns uh, that actually yeah. pain us. Yes. Oh, God, yes, yes. And that's the consciousness part. Where's my pattern? Where's my circle? Where's my pain? You're talking about connection, communication. You know, what's my pain? And, you know, what am I inadvertently spreading on? Because I'm not aware of my pain. And when the consciousness is, there's my pain, and it stays with me. You know, because sometimes, I mean, my children have been a mirror to my pain and a trigger. And my consciousness is now is knowing that it's my stuff you know and I, I i say to my kids i feel really angry today it's got nothing to do with you two but you know i'm feeling angry and and to be able to have the consciousness to say that awesome but uh i see um a very powerful way of saying it that you don't say i am angry you're not identifying what i am feeling angry I am experiencing anger, but you are not the anger. Yeah, that's powerful. You've frozen up. Yes, I see that. Uh, well, maybe we edit that. Is that better? There we are. Okay. Uh, I will edit that out. Okay. Let, let me open the door. Maybe that I get better internet connection. I don't think. I hope that uh, uh, that uh, makes a difference. Doesn't mark anything. That uh, hey, camera. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, the feeling. Yeah, that I like very much what you said. Yeah. That uh, you are not the anger. You don't say I am. I am angry, but I am feeling angry. And I think that's part of your process of uh, how you remain in consciousness. And I would like to explore that. How do you do that? Um, well, it's connected to the nonviolent communication. 
And when I got introduced to MVC, the thing that was the, the, the mind-blowing, door-opening moment was that nonviolent communication is a lot about what your feelings and your needs are. And it gave me a way of connecting to both and, and, and understanding the difference between a feeling and the words that we get used to use to describe feelings, but which are not feelings. For example, I feel let down. Now, let down is not a feeling. Yeah. It's a word you use to describe the situation. But, and, and it was, it was mind-boggling boggling to me but how often I'd started to use words which were false feeling words, and I thought they were feelings. So it was really important for me, first of all, to kind of separate out what were real feelings and what were these sort of false words that I was using. And then, like, wow, God, I've got feelings, <laughs> you know, and, and behind the feelings are needs. So if I'm feeling angry, what do I need? And, 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 and it, that, that was the eye opener. Um, Marshall Rosenberg, who's the, he's the founder of Nonviolent Communication, is a fantastic, amazing speaker, and he lives NBC to such a wonderful extent. Marshall says that NBC is a way of communicating that leads us to give from the heart. And if you can be connecting to your needs and meeting your needs, then you're not asking other people to meet them for you. And then if you can meet someone in that space, then it enables you to connect and be real. And then you can listen to them and find out what their needs are and not necessarily fix it, but provide empathy, provide listening, provide heart. Because it, is, it isn't what sometimes we're missing, it's just that connection. Yeah. Not needing someone to fix something or mend it or make it better, just to be present and connect. Yes, yes. And, and that's the gift. I mean, that's what's so exciting. Okay, give, give, me an ex give us an example, a um, uh, practical example, particularly with your teenagers. Yeah. Mom, I want this. I'm really angry well, about that. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example that's really, well, there's loads of examples. And I'll give you one about my son. And this happened a couple of years ago. He was, he, he was, he was um, really, really angry and went upstairs to his room and slammed the door, stomp, 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 upstairs. And he's got one of these high beds. So he'd lay on his bed right far away from me in the corner and um, he, with his back to me. So I went up after him, you know, and there was, you know, what's the problem? What's the problem? And for about half an hour, he just lay with his back to me. Nothing's going and nothing's going on. So I, I, so I switched to what do you need? Do you need me to listen to you? Hmm. Do you need um, some understanding? Hmm. Do you know, and just can't, you know, and finding as many different ways as I could think of to figure out what his needs were. And actually, after about half an hour, it turned out that he needed me to hear that he was jealous of his sister. Oh, she's gone again. You froze. Yeah, yeah, you can continue. She was jealous of his sister. Um, so after about half an hour of me trying to guess, trying to empathize, asking him questions, it came out that he was jealous of his sister and he needed me to hear that. And he, he just needed to tell it. And his anger was sparked off downstairs, something where he thought his sister had got preferential treatment, had been preferred, and that had triggered his sense of jealousy. And he didn't have the words to say, I'm jealous. He just, you know, got angry. But... What was fabulous is in, in that moment of connection between me and my son, there was trust, it built bridges, it enabled him to know that I was really prepared to work hard to see him. I can't make his jealousy go away. But maybe you did. Just, just giving it a word, just, you know, just, just allowing it to be. 
Ja, ja, ja. Um, yeah, so with the simple fact that he was able to express that he felt jealousy yes. to you, to express it to you, possibly yes. the jealousy disappeared because he felt loved. Yes, and it, it's, it, it's, I don't know if it's jealousy would go forever, but in that moment, the strength of the connection would be enough to allow some healing for him to take place um, and, and that's the beauty of it that's the beauty um, Marshall Rosenberg says that all communication is either a request to have a need to, to be met or the offer to meet a need oh you uh, oh. yeah <laughs> and, yeah. and, and that, 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 that's the beauty that it, it, it's, it's this constant um backwards and forwards, communication happens, and the thought of, hmm, you know, is that a need that someone's, some, someone's um, trying to get met, or are they trying to help me with a need that I'm get, getting uh, asking for? And it really is that simple, uh, as constant backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And, and sometimes with children, even when they're lying on the floor with the biggest temper tantrum in the world, it's not a tem temper tantrum. They've got a need that they really need getting met. Absolutely. And the temper tantrum is the only way they can think of saying it. Absolutely. And maybe that need is, I want more choice. I want more autonomy. I want more freedom. I'm hungry. <laughs> you know. Um, but, and, and, and if we can see that, if we can let go of our stuff, of, oh, they're having a temper tantrum. Oh, I've got to stop it. Oh, I've got to fix it and meet in what's your need, you know, what's going on. And if we can develop the vocabulary to ask children about that, then you have these huge. beautiful connections. It's huge, this, uh, this yeah. part yeah. of not solving the problem. Yes. You know, the, this, this morning, my, my, we don't have a television, but we have an iPad. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is his only way of my son to, to watch uh, uh, cartoons. So yeah. he really wanted to watch the cartoons. And uh, this morning, instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give it to you or, or you are not going to get it, uh, I, uh, I uh, played with uh, uh, nonviolent communication. I played and I told him, I see your need. I acknowledge that you want to watch television or you want to watch your cartoons. And it was magic, you know? It's, uh, you know, at, at three years old and it's television, I, I acknowledge that you want that. I see, I see you, I feel you, I understand what you're saying. It was magic. And how did he respond? Um, uh, he told me, can, uh, can I read a book? Yes, you can read a book. And it was great. It was great because then he felt acknowledged yes. and, uh, and I didn't have to give in to his request and I didn't need to argue with him, no, you're not going to get television. <laughs> so that was really powerful. And, and that, it, that, that's, that this thing about being seen with NVC or being seen and being heard yeah. is, is and as a result of being seen and heard, making connection, making heart-based connection, that's what's very, very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. The, um, uh, uh, maybe you have a, a, an example in which your children uh, taught you something inadvertently. About nonviolent communication? Oh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. Oh, maybe something that uh, you didn't expect? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Oh, the, the, I, something happened about three or four months ago, um, and uh, I was talking to my daughter about somebody who'd been doing some work um, for me on, on, on the house. And I said to her, you know, that I had the feeling that this man was sometimes a bit scared to um, try new things, and um, and that I wished he would tell me that he was scared rather than just not do not not do them. And my daughter said to me, she said, "Isn't it funny, Mum?" how grown-ups can be big on the outside but small on the inside. Wow. Mm. Mm. Wow. 
This is so beautiful. Yeah, isn't it fantastic? Uh, this is terrific. That level of, of um, insight, and she wasn't yet 10. It was just astonishing. Um, and, and pure love talking. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, it was, and she does that. I mean, they both do it all of the time. They both do it. Um, that they're, and that's what I just think is amazing about children, that if you give them the space, that they have such an, an, an insight, an ability to see people. Yeah. Um, that, that, cool. that's, that's, that's astonishing. It, it's astonishing. You know, my, uh, my next-door neighbour is getting a divorce, and mm. my one-year-old cannot know about it. <laughs> uh, my one-year-old doesn't know what divorce is. But yeah. when she sees her, she bursts in tears. Oh, she feels the pain and she feels, yeah. I find that astonishing. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I really uh, believe that when children cry or do a ten temper tantrum, uh, uh, they are saying something we don't understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think when they get older, the temper tantrums are more easy to understand because they have language. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, Certainly when, when they're pre-language or, or still very small, mm -hmm. the temper tantrums are still a way to let you know that they need something and, it, you know, that need is not getting met. Yeah. And, you know, and obviously when they're really babies, it's nappies and food and, you know, those sorts of physical needs. But, you know, certainly a one-year-old gets emotional needs, well, at all from, from, from babies. But, you know, one-year-olds, I remember my son lying on the floor screaming, you know, and, and he, he wanted to have probably more adventure if I know if I know my son um, you know and they yeah ah, children know that they that they they know a lot more than we ever give them credit for my daughter said that to me ah oh, she said she said oh mum I'm so fed up at school because my teachers don't realize how much I can do and I'm fed up of them keeping me small yeah you know wow this is this is just so so well said is yep. uh, we acknowledge so little of what they truly are and the truly they are capable of. Yep, yep. And the more, I mean, the, the more we can give children that balance between the right level of responsibility at their age. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not going to let my ten-year-old drive a car yet. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what I mean by the right level of responsibility at their age. But the more we can give them responsibility and step into their power. Yep. Um, Ah, the, 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 that's the most important thing I think I wish I could give my children that, that understanding of their power <laughs> uh, this is very exciting <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay this is very exciting how uh, we're getting uh, 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 collect uh, disconnected all the time. Isn't it funny? We're trying to talk about communication and we keep getting disconnected. Yeah, yeah. But I say, I, I find that really interesting. And then at the same time, uh, we have the trust that uh, we're connected. <laughs> well, that's the point. Because I, I mean, I, I think this is the, the disconnection is techno technological. Yeah. And the heart connect remains anyway. Yeah. And I th th that's the message for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and not, you know, this whole thing about technology and Facebook and, you know, that's not the way to be connected. Yeah. Um, the, the connection is the energy, heart connection. Yeah. Um, and face to face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, it's so true. It's uh, uh, this, this heart communication. It's, uh, it, it's much more profound than the means. Uh, words or uh, or uh, sign language, like uh, uh, some guests has, have been sharing with us. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, I, I, I still haven't got a, a, a guest to talk about it, uh, but uh, I have experienced lots of telepathy with my children. Yes. And some of my moms experienced telepathy with their children. Uh, I don't know if you had uh, as well this experience. Um, I used to have it with my brother. When I was a child, um, my children are constantly connected, and I think that's because of the twins.